Are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one? Do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA. Hello and welcome to the Environment Matters, a monthly production of the Environmental Protection Agency in Guyana, which highlights the work of the agency in fulfilling its mandate of biodiversity conservation and environmental management. In this month's episode, we take a closer look at the legal operations of the EPA and a much closer look at the legal document that guides the functioning of the agency. Now, joining me in this discussion in studio is Mr. Saeed Hamid. Now, Saeed studied international human rights law at the University of Aberdeen after having completed his studies at the University of Guyana and the Hugh Wooding Law School. He's currently employed at the EPA as the head of the legal unit. Welcome to the program, Saeed. Thank you for the introduction, Narita. I should say welcome back because <laughs> you, you have been on the program before um, sharing information about the ban on single-use plastics from the agency's perspective. Um, but today we'll, we'll take our conversation um, to our holy grail at the agency <laughs> as it's known, the Environmental Protection Act. And the Constitution of Guyana, in fact, recognizes the right of every person to an environment that is not harmful to his or her health or well-being. And it also recognizes that it's the duty of every citizen to participate in activities designed to improve the environment and protect the health of the nation. So right off the bat, um, the supreme law of the land is mm -hmm. you know, backing what we do at the agency. And of course, not leaving out members of the public in you know, matters of environmental protection. So, like I said, we'll begin our discussion by talking about the Environmental Protection Act. And I'd like for you to start by just giving us a background on the act and you know, how it came to be and so on. All right, excellent. So um, I was just going to say, like, uh, I have a, a fellow legal colleague with me. He was uh -huh. speaking of the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, which is essentially what it is, and it does mm -hmm. recognize the right to a safe environment. So I'm glad that we are starting the discussion with that, because even the Constitution is supreme to the Environmental Protection Act, mm -hmm. which is what we um, are governed by. So the Environmental Protection Act was passed in the National Assembly on June 5th, 1996, which is also synonymous with World Environment Day. Yes. So we know that our anniversary is celebrated on that day annually. So the Environmental Protection Act which basically establishes the Environmental Protection Agency. It establishes the Board of Director, which Board of Directors which governs the EPA. It also establishes the Environmental Assessment Board, which is an independent technical review body for EIAs, and there are a number of other things which prescribe functions for the um, EPA in terms of how it protects the environment and manages natural resources. And I, I think there's a lot of significance to maybe the framers of the act, you know, thought it would be best to, to have the act passed on the most significant environmental observance, which is World Environment Day. And, you know, it encourages us to take action on the environment, to really get involved in matters of environmental protection and biodiversity conservation. Definitely, because um, one thing that we noted as well is um, around that time, it was the, the 90s is known as the decade of environmental um, law developments, because we mm -hmm. saw that the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, was enacted in 1992, which is a global convention yes. tackling climate change. Then we had the development of the Kyoto Protocol as well. So the 90s is that era, that decade of where there was like this environmental revolution. And it was, it was good to see Guyana take a part in that, in developing a piece of legislation that established the Environmental Protection Agency. It was around the time as well, I think there was the Oh My um, spill that happened, that incident. Yes. And um, it was a, 
um, a good impetus for developing such legislation and developing an agency that will be responsible for environmental management of Guyana. So it is on that basis, I think um, it was perfect timing. It is, um, it is, there was a need for it at the time and we still see the need for it up to this day. So it has served its purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, you know, I just want our audience to keep in mind that the whole purpose of drafting that act was to protect human health and the health of the natural environment on which we all depend. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take a closer look at one of the more critical components of the work of the agency. Um, it's the environmental authorization process. And that process all starts with you know, someone having an idea and of course money to back it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd like to um, raise chickens or I'd like to, you know, whatever form of, of um, business development um, someone would like to undertake. And of course, we know that whatever it may be would have potential impacts on the environment and human health. And so we start with the submission of an application to the agency. So a developer submits an application to the agency and tell us what happens after. All right, so um, the application process is, is, is prescribed by our authorizations regulations. And I would just wanna add that our legislative framework has produced several media specific mm -hmm. regulations. So you would find that we have regulations for air quality management, hazardous waste management, water quality management, noise management. We have regulations for litter enforcement. We have regulations for the styrofoam ban. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of regulations that were developed under our principal act. And these regulations t um, basically enforce how the authorization process is and how we regulate environmental issues. As you, may, as you are surely aware, and the public should be aware as well, the environmental Protection Agency is guided by the Act, which prescribes a lot of vast functions. So we're responsible for the prevention and control of pollution, we're responsible for integrating public concerns into matters of developments mm -hmm. and um, infrastructural developments, we're responsible for the conservation, of un conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, we're responsible to some extent for the coordination of national protected areas. And we know mm -hmm. we have the whole Protected Areas Commission as well. Yes, indeed. So we have the function as well to coordinate programs for integrated coastal zone management. There's a wide, vast area of um, functions that is prescribed to the agency. And over the years, we've found that there have been more agencies developed, like I use the example of Protected Areas Commission. Yeah, I know PAC is one of those agencies that was spawned off of um, legislation developed by the EPA. Right, and the, the Wildlife Commission is another example of mm -hmm. another um, agency that also has kind of similar functions because we have a function for wildlife conservation as well. So you'll see that um, while the agency may have started with this vast area of um, functions, it has been more refined to date so that we can focus on the prime issues which relate to authorization processes and environmental yes. incidents and so on. So bringing it back to your question, I would say that um, our application process is um, for any activity that is proposed by a developer which may have significant effects or impacts on the environment. So that's our general threshold that we use to try to decide whether a project may require an environmental impact assessment or an, um, it could use a, another type of study, perhaps like an environmental management plan. So you have your no EIA projects and your EIA required projects. All right. So I, I want to touch on, you know, how does the agency decide whether or not a project requires an EIE, an environmental impact assessment, or whether it just requires an environmental management plan? And before we get into that, mm -hmm. um, I think I may have jumped the gun a bit. You know, we just want to touch on what documents should accompany the application. Right. So the um, application, the documents that support the application will be project specific, but mm. generally our minimum requirements are we need proof of land ownership or some kind of legal authority to use the environment within which you want the project mm -hmm. to be developed on. We also require um, approval from the local um, government authority, for example, your NDC or your town council. We okay. also require approval from Central Housing and Planning Authority, which would speak to the appropriateness or the um, compatibility of the location for the intended project or activity. We also require um, a project summary, which would speak to the, sc the scope sorry, mm -hmm. and scale of the project. 
So based on these documents, we're able to decide what other documents we require, which could range from a number of other things. So depending on the, the scope and scale of the project, mm -hmm. the supporting documentation may change. So for example, projects along the coast may require certain type, types, of, types of approval from MARAD, um, Maritime Administration Department mm -hmm. or the Sea Defense Authority. So um, aerodromes, for example, requires civil aviation to have input as well. So mm -hmm. depending on the scope of the project and this location and the kind of receptors in the area, those um, requirements might differ. But our basic minimum requirements are those local government approvals, the proof of land ownership, and the Central Housing and Planning Authority approval. Yeah, and that's, that's critical because the EPA does not work in a silo. The EPA does not work alone. Um, we need our external partners to work along with us, mm -hmm. and of course they do. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, you know, for a viewing audience. All right, so we're to the point of the agency going through the screening process. Um, there is a tool developed by the agency um, which the officers use to assess whether or not a project, you know, would have a very significant impact on the environment or, or you know, whether it's enough to just require an EMP. So, Saeed, we, we've been mentioning this screening tool that, you know, has been used by the agency um, to determine whether projects um, should have an EIA study done or whether we should have an EMP. Um, Take us through, you know, the screening tool. Right. So uh, I think that's a very excellent and pertinent question. Um, I think the, the, the screening that is conducted by the agency is by no means a unilateral process, and it is not a kind of abstract um, discriminatory process in any way. It's actually been um, a screening tool that has been developed specifically for that purpose by an independent consultant in consultation with the agency as well as other stakeholders and sister agencies that we work with. So this um, screening tool was developed with 68 indicators or questions that are scored and then based on the sum summation of the scores, mm -hmm. then it determines whether or not an EIA is required or not based on a threshold. So it's by no means um, a process that is defined by one person's input. It actually mm -hmm. requires input from other sectors within the EPA and these are led by senior environmental officers with um, who are certified and qualified to do what they're doing with exposure and institutional knowledge. And they're also um, screening the, the project summary that I referred to before in terms mm -hmm. of the location and the other documents supporting the application. So they look at all of these things before they make a decision as to whether an EIA is required or not. And generally speaking, an EIA is required for large scale projects that re require large portions of land or large portions of water, for example, mm -hmm. for a project. And um, where there are multiple streams of waste, where there are high emission levels, there are high discharge levels, high effluent levels, your uh, manganese production, your large-scale mining productions, your petroleum production operations. These are the large-scale EIA, typically EIA projects. All right, so there are those persons, you know, who would read the Sunday papers and you know, or follow us on social media, and you would see from time to time public notices for projects, whether they're the EIA projects or those that do not require an EIA and they're placed on 30 days notice. So right. um, let's clarify for our audience, you know, let's go through the stages of when a project is placed on 30 days notice. Um, what does that mean exactly? Right. So um, the, the public notices is by no means something the agency has to do optionally or something it has to consider whether to do or not. Mm -hmm. the, the notices that are published, whether it's 30 days or 28 days, which I'll get in, into, don't get confused. Yes. <laughs> but the, um, the different notices that are published by the agency, the agency is mandated by law to do so. The agency is mandated to um, ensure that public concerns are integrated into matters of the environment, as well mm -hmm. as specifically in a decision where an EIA is required, the agency is mandated to publish a 28-day notice where an EIA is required and it wants the public to share any concerns or questions they want to see that EIA address. Mm -hmm. Within that 28 day as provided for in the law, you can send any submissions that you want to the agency for what you want to see in that EIA. Okay. So that 28-day notice applies to EIA projects. Where Only. the agency, right. 
where the agency now has decided that an EIA is not required, it is mandated to publish a 30-day notice. Now, the 30-day notice gives members of the public who may be affected by the project to submit appeals to the agency as to why perhaps an EIA should be requested. So it's very important that when you see these public notices in the newspaper, yeah. you don't just gloss past them and think that they're not important. It's the agency complying with its statutory mandate to ensure that members of the public have a right to either appeal or submit comments or submit concerns to the agency. So remember your 28-day notice is for your EIA projects where you want to include some questions or concerns or issues you want to see highlighted or addressed by that EIA, send that to us. And then your 30-day for no EIA required, if you don't agree with that decision or you want to know how the agency came to that decision that, a no, not, uh, that an EIA sorry, is not required, you can send that um, submission to us as well. Yes, and another thing that is important with the public notices is for the public to go on our website or visit the agency to get a copy of the project summary and not just, you know, see a project of a particular nature and, okay, how, how did they even decide that this project does not require an EIA and they should do an EIA for this, you know. So it's important for you to read the project summaries, get an understanding of what is intended and then submit your comments and queries to the agency. That's a very good point too because the, the and I, it underscores the importance of having a robust project summary. So developers mm -hmm. too, when they're submitting their application to the agency with those documents that we require that I referenced before, the project summary must address all different components and phases of the proposed project and be able to speak to those things so that the agency in its screening can detect you know, how best to make its mm -hmm. decision when it's using that screening tool, as well as for the members of the public who have access to the project summary and may want to address some of their concerns and so on. It might very well be already addressed or not even a concern once you go through that project summary. So it saves everybody time as well. All right. Yes, indeed. All right, so let's, you, you mentioned a few, but let's talk about some of the projects that require environmental authorization because not every single you know, business business proposal requires an EA. But let's talk about those that definitely do. Right, so the um, environmental authorization applies to basically any of the operations that speak to our media-specific regulations, mm -hmm. for example. So any facility that is operating, storing, or treating hazardous waste needs to be applied. Um, mm -hmm. Any facility or operation related to commerce or industry that's discharging air contaminants, that's discharging effluent or wastewater that's um, emitting noise and in industrial levels. Those types of operations require environmental authorization. So these can range from places like um, hazardous material storage plants or warehouses, mm -hmm. um, facilities such as um, rice mills, large-scale ag agricultural developments, uh, your mining operations, your petroleum operations, exploration and production. Um, you have gas stations and fuel storage and fuel farms. They also require environmental authorization. All right. So I'd just like to add a few sure. that I, I found while perusing <laughs> <laughs> the Environmental Protection Act. Um, the harvesting and utilization of our forest resources, um, the extraction and conversion of mineral resources. And this is one that I found interesting. Um, the installation of hydroelectrical energy production, um, given that, you know, we are moving or we're already in the, the green state mm -hmm. um, frame of mind. And the release, use or keeping of any genetically modified organis mm -hmm. organisms, yes. um, the GMOs. All right. So, so we, those are some yes. of the... Um, those are some of the activities that are specifically provided for in the full schedule of the Act mm -hmm. that requires an environmental authorization. So um, those are some of the specific areas. I think it also includes highways, roadways, and um, yes. dams, some as well as... infrastructure projects. Right, hotels as well. So um, those mm -hmm. are just some of the projects that are specifically provided for in the legislation that require environmental authorization. And we've been following that to the T. <laughs> All right, so is it only these projects or are there other projects that are catered for in the act? Right, so the act uses the threshold of any project which may significantly affect the environment. So 
um, generally speaking, that is a threshold that can take you really far, it can bring you really low in terms of your okay. operations. <laughs> so right. I think that's why the agency took the step of developing a screening criteria so that we don't find ourselves making abstract decisions, that decisions need to be informed, mm -hmm. need to be quantitative and qualitative, it needs to be um, done on a, a basis that is data-driven and can, that can be supported and justified. So developing the screening tool was a good step in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, the things that fall short of the screening tool that don't require an EIA, it still requires an environmental authorization provided that there is going to be an environmental impact or risk associated with that project. Good. So I'm glad you talked about that because now I want to talk about the types of permits that are issued by the EPA because of course at the end of that process the developer may or may not walk away with a permit. Mm -hmm. So what are the types of permits that are issued by the EPA? That's also a good question. You, you can prepare it, Aretha. I'm, I'm going to try to address everything. So your operation permit, for example, is mm -hmm. one of the permits where you don't require an EIA. The agency issues an operation permit so that you can operate. Right. Basically, that's what it does. The operation permit addresses um, existing operations, so they're allowed to be authorized by the agency with that type of permit. Mm -hmm. Your environmental permit, the agency currently issues an environmental permit for EIA projects. So where the project is subject to the conduct of an EIA, you would get an environmental permit once it is approved. And we know there's a process for approval of projects that require yes. EIAs, which we'll get into after. But um, there is a statutory process the agency has to follow in determining whether to approve an EIA project. So once you've satisfied everything with that EIA, you can get an environmental permit or you may not. And you might have to just walk away sad and not being able to do your project. Wow. <laughs> Let's hope it never has to happen though. Yes, indeed. And you also have the construction permit. Now this is one that we've had, um, it's a little more popular now as everyone looking around Guyana right now and of course our oh, landscape, yes. you're seeing construction everywhere. It's an ever-changing landscape. Right. It's an ever-changing landscape. Skyscrapers type buildings are coming up now and large scale type buildings. And um, our construction permit is becoming more prevalently required and more persons are coming in to get them and not very, very many people are aware that they need a construction permit from the EPA. So the construction permit is another permit from which um, where contaminants may be discharged into the environment based on the construction phases of your type of project, you will require a construction permit. All right. So with that, it's time for our first commercial break and we'll see you on the other half of the show. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Notice the other day, y'all had a big, big campaign with them police officers, so shutting down them people, barbecue, wedding, dance. Man, how y'all expect these people to make money and survive? Oh, Miss Cheryl, that is far from the truth. The EPA and the Guyana Police Force are actually working together to ensure that persons who conduct certain businesses and activities are authorized. We've tried to allow them to adhere to the noise regulation. Well, this is going to be a new law. What well, lies this? These laws were always in place. It's now that we get in all these complaints at the agency, we are trying to enforce them. The Environmental Protection Act has been in place since 1996, and it states that persons and businesses must apply for environmental authorization before operating a song-making device. 
Well, girl, I never know this thing is part to the law. So if you're keeping a barbecue or an open air function, like a wedding or a concert, especially in your community, right? And you're playing a music system, you have to apply for a short term noise permit. And for persons that operate in a business and you got generators and stuff, you have to apply for a long term permit. And that is applicable to bars and hotspots and clubs also. Well, now that you explain it, I understand it. It's unfair to the elderly, sick people, and even them little children. That is correct. According to the World Health Organization, loud noise can cause stress, sleep deprivation, and hearing impairment. And I sure you wouldn't want that. Oh, now I understand. Thank you for explaining it, Miss Sue. For more information, you can contact the EPA at 225-5471 or visit our office at Ganji Street, North Sophia, Georgetown. Welcome back to our show. Um, during the first half of our discussion, Said was, you know, sharing with us a bit about the Environmental Protection Act and some of the components of that act that really guide the work of the agency. So we continue talking about the EP Act and in this part of the show, we're going to talk about enforcement. Um, there are certain rights that are afforded to environmental officers under the Environmental Protection Act and we'd like to you know, share with the public what are some of those rights because we have unfortunately um, have had incidents from time to time where officers were obstructed from you know, conducting their duties, whether it's, you know, dealing with complaints or whether it was at, at some part of the authorization process. So we'd like to remind the public of the rights of officers under the Act. Right. Um, that's actually a very pertinent area to discuss because, um, I, like you said, you we are aware of instances where officers are sometimes accosted by persons when they go out in the field. So it is good to be proactive to ensure the members of the public are aware that these officers are protected by law and they are empowered by law mm -hmm. to do what they are doing. So the officers of the, of the agency are empowered to enter premises at reasonable times to investigate offenses under our act. They are also um, allowed to enter for the purpose of examination and investigation of the premises in relation to any complaint matters, to take measurements, photographs, to make recordings for investigation so they can take samples of, of soil, they can take samples of water, they can mm -hmm. take air assessments, noise assessments, and so on. They can um, require anyone who has re they have reasonable cause to believe can share information in relation to the offense or the complaint to provide that information to them and even sign a certificate of truth which would be admissible in court, so they can um, require these things of persons that they are investigating. They can also um, ask that in situations where there is a spill, for example, or an environmental incident, mm -hmm. they can order that that area remain untouched and preserved for the purposes of an investigation. So, that's a, yeah, so, <laughs> so at these any are point, you'll see like crime scene, you know, crime scene <laughs> pretty tape much, across. Pretty much. Yes. They can, um, in the same way with like crime scenes, the agency can lock off an area and have it preserved mm -hmm. for investigation purposes. The agency could also um, take samples and articles that are relating to the, um, take possession of the articles that are related to the pollution incident and also dismantle anything that could be related to a pollution incident. So persons need to be cognizant in that when they're using these types of equipment that are causing nuisances and environmental impacts adversely to the people and the receptors around them, mm -hmm. that the agency has the power to take that away from you if you can't you know, use it properly or safely. So these are some of the powers that are available to officers of the agency. It is also worth knowing that um, persons who assault, obstruct, or hinder an authorized officer of the agency in executing these functions are subject to penalties including imprisonment. So you'd want to yes. check Section 35 and Section 38 of our um, Principal Act, which speaks to the powers of the officers mm -hmm. as well as the, um, the penalties for assaulting or obstructing or hindering our officers when they're carrying out their duties. 
Yeah, and when we talk about obstructing, please do not let your dogs loose on the officers because that can be counted as obstructing an officer from yes. conducting his or her duties. We've had instances before where yes. that were the case. Somebody would lose their pit bull in the yard and not let the officer in, and the yeah. officer would be, can you kindly restrain your pit bull and put it away mm -hmm. so that I can carry out my investigation? They refused, and well, you're hindering that officer from carrying out their duties that are statutory, so yeah. you're obstructing the work of the agency. Yes, and I just wanted to clarify something that you said. So when you talk about reasonable hours, mm. what, what do we consider reasonable? Right, so um, this is, this is a, a popular question from the officers of the agency mm -hmm. because they're aware of this, this section of the act. So they always ask, what is considered reasonable hours? Yeah. So I think um, this, for example, the complaints in relation to um, noise, for example, like excessive noise coming from an area mm -hmm. and um, it is happening at 11 p.m. every night. The agency can go and do an inspection at 8 a.m. in the morning, taking noise readings and so on, when the crux of the matter is 11 p.m. noise, right. excessive noise emissions. So what is reasonable will all to be considered in terms of the circumstances. Okay. So in the circumstance of this one, we have an 11 p.m. matter that is pollution, a pollution incident. The agency will have to go out at 11 p.m. to do their noise readings. That is mm -hmm. reasonable in the circumstances. Okay. So what is reasonable will always be considered within context. Good. So I'm, I'm glad we cleared that up because I've always wondered, you know, what do you consider reasonable? Is, is 2 a.m. reasonable? Is 9 o'clock reasonable? But of course, it all depends on the circumstance. And of right. course, we don't want to obstruct the officers who are only there to do their jobs. So as we continue on in our discussion with enforcement, let's talk about what types of enforcement actions the agency can take? So there are several um, enforcement actions prescribed by our legislative framework. Um, there are three types of notices, for example, that the agency can issue. Mm -hmm. You can have your cessation notice, you can have your prohibition notice or your enforcement notice. Your cessation notice or cessation order will be used in situations where a person or a developer has commenced a project without getting an environmental permit or without mm -hmm. conducting an EIA. So for those developers out there that think they can hide from the EPA and start doing their um, hotel constructions or their roadway construction or their, their schemes or whatever type of project that we need to authorize, the agency has the authority to issue a cease cessation notice or a cease order that would basically in effect ask you to stop all works at the project site. Right, so just in case you slip through the cracks because there are other agencies um, from which permission is required. Right. So just in case you, you happen to slip through the cracks, we can is, issue that cease order. Yeah, so the developers out there that know to yourselves you've started yeah. and you don't have your environmental permit, you we urge you, us. come call us. Because if we issue the cease order, now it's hard to have it lifted because you would not have been subjected to our authorization process. And then you, as I mentioned right. before, you have to go through the statutory process, of publishing and so on. So it actually may cost you long, much more time in the long run to have to come back into the process later in the game because yes, then you won't indeed. be able to get your authorization. Indeed. So you have your prohibition notice as well, which is where there is any serious threat to natural resources or there's any um, risk of serious damage to public health or the environment. The agency can issue a prohibition notice, which stops the activity. So it doesn't matter if you need authorization or not. It doesn't matter if um, mm -hmm. the, you're currently authorized by the agency. Any activity that you're doing that causes serious threat to natural resources or that is causing um, a risk of, of serious damage to public health and the environment, the agency can issue a prohibition notice. Um, just to note too, there are offenses for breaching those notices. So once you've received them, you're urged to comply mm -hmm. because then we will have to proceed to court or we could administer penalties for um, failing to comply with the notice. Yeah, and our final notice would be our enforcement notice. Our enforcement notice are for authorized facilities. So if you're currently an operator that has an authorization with the agency and you there's a number of conditions and terms that will be in that authorization. If, you don't, if you're not complying with any one of those terms or conditions, we can issue an enforcement notice. So mm -hmm. when we come around to do our monitoring or our en environmental audits or compliance checks, and we note that you, you're not complying with some of the conditions, mm -hmm. we can issue an enforcement notice. And you'll be liable for contravening 
each or any one of those um, conditions contained in that enforcement notice. So the more non-compliances, the more liable you may be rendered in court. All right, and of course you mentioned court. So prosecution is of course an enforcement action that the agency takes. Right. And um, our, let's touch a bit yeah. on that. So in terms of the prosecution, the agency as a last resort uses prosecution because the agency is also empowered to administer a fixed penalty. Mm -hmm. So what you will find is the agency will offer you the chance to pay a fixed penalty under Section 46 of our Act, which allows you to pay the minimum fine for the offense, two-thirds of the minimum, mm -hmm. in order to discharge your liability in court. So rather than going to court, we'll offer you the opportunity to pay two-thirds of the minimum, which is still less than if you go to court, you're going to have to pay more. Yes, we offer you that opportunity. Fees, of course. Pardon? Attorney's fees, of course. Oh, there you yes. go. So once you've proceeded to court, yeah. you have to, the judge has the discretion to give you the maximum penalty, mm -hmm. plus you have to pay your legal costs. So we'll offer you that olive branch. So mm -hmm. you can pay a fixed penalty, and then we will discharge your conviction in court, and then we'll be able to bring you back into compliance. The agency doesn't always use this, though, because mm -hmm. um, we don't want to be in a position of re rewarding bad behavior as well. Yes, Sometimes you need to be hauled before the court so that you can be subjected to harsher penalties, including in prison, imprisonment. Sorry. So the agency tries to um, walk a fine line in between of where mm -hmm. we are offering this opportunity to developers who are absconding us or who are um, contravening our requirements, as well as those who we see good faith efforts that they're trying mm -hmm. to come into compliance. So, for example, like I mentioned before, the developers that have started their construction yes. and started their operations and haven't gotten their authorizations, you come into us, that's a good faith effort. We will not penalize you for having good faith relations with the agency. Yes, and of course, we, we always look to work with all our stakeholders. We don't want to you know, end up at the very last stage right. of prosecution. So that brings us to the end of our discussion on legal operations at the EPA. So, uh, yes, and of course I'll invite you to, to give any closing remarks to our audience. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, in, term, in addition to the enforcement powers though, we have pollution offenses. Mm -hmm. So any activity that's causing or is likely to cause pollution mm -hmm. of the environment or any activity that causes serious environmental harm or material environmental harm are also subject to penalties and imprisonment. And all of our penalties are prescribed in the fifth schedule of our legislation, among going as far as over $2 million. So I know that might not seem a lot right now. I just, I just heard it when I said as far as $2 million. <laughs> and I was like, wait, but that's... <laughs> but the agency is currently mm -hmm. looking into revising its fifth schedule, so we have stronger penalties. Mm -hmm. So um, this will give us stronger enforcement action as well. So all of that is a work in progress, especially in relation to Guyana's developmental trajectory now. We yeah. note that... Um, there are more developments and more facilities which need to be authorized, which means, sadly, that sometimes there will be more people that don't want to follow the requirements of the legislation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we need to also have a strong enforcement arm as we approach these matters. Yeah, and definitely more potential incidents of pollution. So, you know, we, we urge you <laughs> to get your applications in and work along with the agency to get authorized yeah and when you have your authorization uh -huh. in force for example and we come around to do our and compliance check our enforcement checks and so on make sure that you're compliant with our uh, requirements on the terms and conditions of that authorization because mm -hmm. the agency also reserves the right to cancel or suspend that authorization mm -hmm. which means you'll have to um, sus suspend your operations and your um, your activity so if you have a business that's running it's in your best interest if you want to keep the food on the table and keep operating and keep um, yeah. your staff and employees with you, make sure you're complying with our requirements because it is good to um, ensure that more people emphasize and understand the importance of the environment and the impacts on the environment as a result of their operations and their activities. Yes, and indeed there are numerous benefits to getting authorized. You know, you save yourself time, you mm -hmm. save yourself um, a whole lot of money. You, you save yourself conflict with other stakeholders and the list, of course, goes on and on. Mm -hmm. um, so that brings us to the very end <laughs> of our show. So uh, um, maybe I'll just summarize um, some of the things that yes. we touched on. Yes, so, right. I'll, so I'll give Saeed the chance to just, <laughs> you know, summarize our, our entire show for today. To share. All right, so in a nutshell, what I wanted to just have everyone at yes. home that's listening take away is that um, any activity that can 
cause significant impacts in the environment could require an environmental authorization. If you're not mm -hmm. sure, just call the agency or send in an application. These can range from projects like hotel construction, roadways, um, hospitals, um, mining, o um, mining operations, petroleum operations, um, infrastructural developments. These are all um, some of the activities that require authorization. When you send in your authorization to us, we go through a robust screening tool that is involving the different sectors of the agency that was developed specifically for the purpose of deciding whether an EIA is required or not. EIAs are generally for large-scale projects with multiple waste streams, multiple emissions and discharges of effluent mm -hmm. and um, noise too, um, in large areas of land or large areas of water or with impacts on very sensitive receptors. So you'll find like your mining operations and so on or large-scale ones are subjected to EIAs or petroleum production operations. Um, our officers are protected by law to carry out their inspections. So when they come to do their site inspection or complaint investigation, oh, yes. they are protected and empowered to come in to take readings, take measurements, take photographs. If you're giving them a hard time, they can dismantle the equipment or apparatus that you're using that's causing to um, causing some pollution or contravening some regulation or, or provision within our legislation. They're protected, they cannot be assaulted, obstructed, or hindered from doing what they're doing. That is an offense under the law. So these are just some of the legal things that we touched on um, during this session that I want members of the public to be cognizant of okay. so that the agency can continue to, to do its work smoothly. And those that work with us, we work with them. So if you're doing an operation right now and you don't, you're not authorized, the sooner you come into us, the better. Yes, and I'd just like to remind persons as well that all that we do is in keeping with our mandate to protect human health, your health, my health, our health, um, and the health of the environment on which we depend. So remember to get authorized. If you have a business, um, if you're thinking about starting a business and you're not sure about whether you require you know, an environmental permit or not, come into the agency, you can call us. There are multiple avenues for you to make contact with the agency. Um, remember to keep updated with the work of the EPA by following us on social media. You can pick up a copy of the Sunday Chronicle or the Ghana Times um, to read our weekly column where we'll share that information with you. Um, like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, as I said, there are multiple ways in which you can contact the agency. And of course, remember, the environment is everybody's business. Thank you for joining us. information. Good morning. I am Odessa Duncan, Senior Environmental Officer. How may I assist you today? Tell me something. They got this man next door by me breaking on this big, big building and his bare asbestos in the roof. I could remember hearing on your TV program that asbestos is dangerous to human health and the environment. This is correct. The Environmental Protection Act states that any person or facility that is storing, treating, transporting, and or disposing of hazardous waste material must be authorized by the EPA to do so. Oh, but it's now we're really hearing about this hazardous waste thing. Tell me something more. Hazardous waste are waste material with properties that are dangerous or capable of having a harmful effect on human health and the environment, including things like paint, fertilizers, and pesticides, waste oil, and asbestos. These things have the potential to cause cancer, birth defects, kidney failure, and reproductive impairment, with children being at the highest risk. The environmental authorization in this case gives the legal right 
to transport, store, and dispose of this material in accordance with the EP Act, Chapter 2005, Laws of Guyana. This ensures you and your operation and your process is safe for the environment and human health. So you mean to tell me that all them leftover Christmas paint that I got on in my kitchen sink, I need authorization from EPA to get rid of it? No, Miss Deborah. These items once used for household purposes does not require environment authorization from the EPA. However, you should still take necessary steps to ensure that these materials are stored and disposed of in an environmentally safe manner. Thank you so much for the information. I go in and tell him that he needs an environmental authorization. Thank you. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Attention all miners. Mining is important to Ghana's development, and so is our biodiversity. Practice smart mining. Use a retort, dispose of your waste properly, manage your tailings well, and reclaim mined out areas. Remember, improper mining is a threat to your health, biodiversity, and a hindrance to prosperity. A message from the Environmental Protection Agency and Ministry of Natural Resources, with funding from JEP through the United Nations. Are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one? Do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA. 